Okay. Well, Dr. Newbegin, um. <laughs> yeah. is, this, is he coming our way or is he? I don't think. I think he's going away. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, tell us a little bit about your interaction with Sam Kimmelason. How do you know Sam Kimmelason? Well, Sam Kamalason and I, of course, uh, were together in Madras for a number of years uh, when I was bishop and he was uh, the minister of the Methodist Church there. And I did have the privilege of meeting him from time to time and also of, of hearing him and uh, hearing something of the, the power and uh, persuasiveness of his message. We've not had uh, contact directly for a long time, but of course I've known about his work with World Mission Vision and uh, greatly admired it. And um, he's obviously led uh, World Vision into a much broader and more holistic way of understanding the whole mission of the Church. And I'm very moved to hear that he is now retiring. I hope that that means that he will have more time available for his own beloved India. But in any case, I will be only one of, of thousands of people who will be thanking God for his ministry and wishing him well. If my experience of retirement is anything normal, and I think it is, he will find that he is much busier in his retirement than he ever was when he was, quote, unquote, employed. I certainly wish him well. to India in 1936, 11 years before independence. So we began our ministry under the British Raj when we were sahibs with pith helmets. We're ready. Okay. Sorry. You want to do it again? Let's do that again. Uh, Helen and I went to India in 1936, which uh, was 11 years before independence. And so we were part of the old British Raj. Uh, I was uh, an old-fashioned district missionary um, with uh, a responsibility for uh, an, area of, an area of villages and I lived in the city of Kanchipuram which is one of the most holy cities of India. I was involved of course like all my colleagues with schools. I was teaching in a high school I was looking after village schools. I also did a lot of street preaching. I also did a lot of sitting down with the Hindu monks in the Ramakrishna mission and uh, discussing with them, studying with them the Bible and the Upanishads and uh, engaging in discussion with them. Um, I found that it was a very exciting time because, well, it was a very challenging time. I found that the traditional pattern of such missionary work had been that when any community, a village community, expressed an interest in the gospel, the first thing that you did was to appoint a catechist who went and lived in that village and taught them. But like missionary societies at many times in the history of the church, we were having a financial crisis. So there were instructions from headquarters on no account to increase the budget, which meant no more catechists, which meant stop preaching the gospel. Now, I thought there must be a flaw there. I didn't think that in the Great Commission, uh, Jesus had said, go and make disciples of all nations, provided your budget is in a good shape that there must be something wrong. And it also struck me that these village Christian communities, because they were looked after by a paid person from outside, never really thought of themselves as the Holy Catholic Church in that place. They thought of themselves as being a sort of outstation of a mission with the headquarters in the big bungalow where I lived. And I felt that a, a radical change in pattern was needed. And so I set myself to try to help some of these village elders, most of whom were illiterate, but who had, of course, a lot of wisdom and experience, to become the real leaders of their local congregations. 
Well, I didn't get so very far with that because after 1947, 48, 47, um, the union of the churches took place and I was picked up and dropped down in a city, the city of Madurai to be the first bishop of the United Church where we had Anglicans and Congregationalists and Presbyterians all to be knit together into one family. But again, in the good providence of God, uh, there had been, as you know, an enormous financial crisis in the United States. With, and the major mission in that area was an American mission. And so they had had to cut down their workers and close uh, a great many of their schools so that out of the 700 or so congregations in the diocese, um, at least a third and probably nearly a half had no resident worker. And so I set myself as a kind of first priority to develop the training of volunteer leaders for these congregations. Um, and I, I, I very quickly discovered that the way you train uh, is not to send a person to a seminary, we better let that go. Sorry about this. So um, I set myself as a, as a high priority to develop the training of, uh, of local village leaders for these congregations. To begin with, we experimented by sending them for short periods to, to our seminary. But I very soon discovered that that was a disastrous mistake uh, for two reasons. Firstly, because a man who can be away from his village for three months is not one of the leaders in his village. By, by definition, he is a bright, young, unemployed school graduate. And that's not the kind of material from which local leadership is made. And for the second reason, that uh, in that training you're taking them right out of the proper setting. So we had to abandon that and develop uh, a new pattern of training, which is done entirely on the spot. And in other words, during the agricultural off-season, in the very hot weather when no agriculture is possible, we would have intensive courses in the villages, uh, helping to train these men and women um, in very simple elements of Bible knowledge or, and, and understanding worship uh, and, and understanding how to lead worship and understanding how to um, give a simple message from a paragraph in the Bible. And I very soon discovered that uh, after a year or two of this, it was the congregations with this voluntary leadership which were the most lively and the most uh, growing uh, of the congregations rather than those under uh, full-time leadership. And I became convinced that uh, this is the right pattern. I was influenced by the reading of Roland Allen, his book, uh, Missionary Methods, St. Paul's or Ours where he points out that St. Paul never established an Antioch mission in Galatia with the uh, mission bungalows and all that. He um, stayed with the folks long enough to give them the Bible, or at least the, the knowledge of the, of the gospel, the sacraments, and, and a ministry, the apostolic ministry. And then he passed on and went net to the next place but kept always in touch with them and sent people to encourage them and so on. And um, I, be, I, I, I had so many experiences of finding that the gospel was taking hold and spreading in ways that I knew nothing about, uh, that were not planned or organized by anybody. Uh, the end of my seven-year period as a district missionary in Kanchipuram, when I looked back on the work that I'd been doing, I thought I had done the kinds of things that a missionary ought to do. And bless my soul, people were getting baptized and converted. But when I went into any particular case, I always found it had nothing to do at all with anything that I had done. Um, the Lord was doing his own thing in his own way. And I am more and more sure that, um, yes, we have to be faithful in doing the job to which we're entrusted and for which we're trained. 
but the, the mission is God's mission, and uh, it, it, it's the work of the Holy Spirit in ways that we can never fully understand, much less fully program, that is the decisive factor in bringing people to Christ. Those, the 12 years that I had in Madhuri as the first bishop of a new diocese, helping former Anglicans and former Reformed from very, very different traditions to learn to respect each other and love each other and live together in one family. Uh, that These were the most um, fulfilling years in my whole life, I must say. And I look back on those with immense gratitude. For the world, are you wrong? Well, uh, for me, coming back from India and settling down in England was in many ways quite a traumatic experience. I found it a much bigger culture shock than I had felt when we went to India. Because in India, the church, with all its faults, and God knows they're very, very serious faults, the church has a confidence in the gospel. Um, people are not ashamed to talk about the gospel to their neighbors. The church grows, not because of great evangelistic efforts, but because ordinary Christians talk to their friends. And um, as the bishop in Madras, I had been going around opening and dedicating new churches all over the place. Uh, and I was accustomed to living in a, in a confident and growing church, even though, of course, it is a small proportion of the whole population of India. Coming back to England, I found an extraordinarily timid church where we were apologizing. Uh, and and, and uh, so, so far from opening up churches, it became a, a main sort of professional occupation of ministers to close down churches. And I found that there was an extraordinary reluctance to talk about the gospel. Uh, early on in my period back in England, I was asked to talk to a group of theological teachers and, and, and postgraduate students. And in the course of my talk, I used the word gospel a number of times. And these chaps looked at me and they said, gospel, what do you mean by gospel? They had, I mean, there was a gospel according to John, a gospel according to Paul, a gospel according to Tillich, a gospel according to Bart or whatever. But there was no, there was nothing, it seemed, it seemed the, the sort of, the kind of given reality of what God has done in Jesus Christ didn't seem to be at the foundation of their thinking at all. And I, I, I became convinced that Looking, I had been working for the World Council of Churches and therefore I'd been accustomed to taking a global view of the whole situation of Christianity. And I, I came to the conviction that really this was the most serious missionary encounter anywhere going on in the world, that while the church is, is growing confidently in so many parts of the world, here in Europe it is so apologetic, so timid, so defensive so deferential in the face of the claims of, of science and, uh, and secular history and so forth. And so through various, I mean, you never plan these things, you know, God leads you in all kinds, you never plan these things. Uh, it, it, you are led from point to point by all kinds of so-called accidents. Uh, um, uh, but I was led into a situation where um, I, I was asked to write a little pamphlet for the British Council of Churches, uh, which I called The Other Side of 1984. Uh, and um, this was uh, just an attempt to, to pose the questions that it seems to me the gospel addresses to our Western culture. Well, um, this thing took off and sold a huge number of copies. And so I got a sort of avalanche of, of correspondence from all kinds of people, a great many of them lay people, um, a great many of them lay people who felt that this had opened up uh, a perspective for them. And so I got, one way or another, I got drawn into the, the whole business of, of trying to, to uh, articulate the gospel. In other, words, in other words, to look at England as a foreign missionary. Um, to, to use the experience 
of the world mission, the cross-cultural mission of the church, in order to, to address the questions that are involved in tackling modernity. Now, of course, I think in some ways things have moved on because I, I'm more and more aware of the fact that, that modernity is breaking down, that the great enlightenment project of modernity, which looked for the uh, bringing together of the whole human race uh, on the basis of reason, um, of, of, of the advance of science and so forth, that this is now breaking down, that there is a profound skepticism about all the things that the 19th century was so confident about. So in some ways the situation changes, but when I am asked to talk uh, in, uh, w with groups of people, unless I, I'm specifically asked for uh, some other subject, I usually try to take the very simple point that the gospel is true, and therefore it is public truth. It is not private opinion, it is public truth, and it, has, it must be part of the great public debate that goes on. The other thing, of course, that I am most often asked to speak about is the question, why Jesus, or why Jesus only? Why not somebody else? Why, why do we have to go on talking about Jesus when there are so many other gurus in the world? I mean, that's the other thing that I get very often asked to talk about. But, as I say, the, my main concern is just this very simple point um, that the Gospel is true <laughs> and that we can believe it, that we have grounds for believing it. And that a great deal of what passes for self-evident truth in our culture is nonsense and that we have to expose it. I get very cross when I hear clergymen, I don't know whether this happens in the States, but I hear clergymen talking about the real world in contrast to what goes on in the church, you know? Um, when we go out into the real world, well, <laughs> which is the real world? Uh, in my book, the real world uh, is the world that we're dealing with when we are at worship, when we are studying the Bible, when we are celebrating the sacraments, when we are sharing the life in Christ. That's the real world. And the stories that the world tells about itself in the media and all so on is mostly phony. Um, but it's this, it's this, well, it's all part of the privatization game. Uh, you, 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 your religion is something for the private life, and if you take it out into the marketplace, then you have to apologize for it. Now, it's that I want to attack. What's the answer for the church? What's the, what is the deliverance from this inward uh, preoccupation? Well, I think, as always, one has to pursue a double course. You, first of all, I think, have to... Uh, that you, you need to bring a note of encouragement to the church. To, 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 I, think, I think it's very helpful to help the church to, to see uh, the... The, the, the foolishness of a great deal of what is taken for granted. Um, if I may take a simple example, I mean, you, you uh, take, for example, uh, a thing like the writings of John Hick, who have had a great deal of influence uh, in this country, um, in his book, uh, The Myth of Christ Incarnate, where uh, the, the very idea that God could be present in a babe in Bethlehem or a man hanging on a cross is absurd. And everybody says, you know, this is a very courageous, radical thinker. He's raising profound questions and so forth. The whole point is that he is not raising the real question. The real question you have to ask is, why does he say that it is impossible that God should be incarnate? The answer has to be because he already knows what God is. Where did he get that knowledge from? What is the basis of it? If you really probe behind it, you'll find that there is a whole lot of philosophical ideas there behind it about God, which he takes for granted without questioning. And only because of those, he questions the Christian message. Now, we have to reverse the process and, and put the question to him. What are your grounds for believing in this God? Personally, I don't believe in it. Um, I believe that God has made, known, made himself known in Jesus Christ, and there is where I start. And that's the basis on which I criticize other beliefs. 
Um, uh, so the church has to be given a, a kind of courage to, um, to raise these, these kind of questions. Secondly, of course, uh, as I say, there has to be always, the, the, it, it, the church has to go out and involve itself in the lives of ordinary people. And here is where the tremendous task is, uh, and a very difficult task. And it's a task primarily for lay people discern in the worlds of economics or business or the media or the arts or whatever, to discern the places where the Christian message about God's nature and purpose impinges on contemporary practice and requires us to challenge it. And that's a very long-term and difficult task where primarily the lay people actually working at the coalface, so to speak, are the ones that have to, uh, have to bear the main load. But also, I think the kind of things that, um, that Sam Kamalason has been giving himself to, where the church is in the position of solidarity with the poor and the uh, and, the, uh, and the needy and the oppressed. That's the proper point of view from which the gospel makes sense. The gospel doesn't make so much sense when it's embodied in powerful and sometimes rather worldly institutions. Let's talk about, let's close by talking about the poor a little bit in, in India. Um, about this incarnational model of ministry, what is your perspective now on, uh, on what will be what will be a model or the model uh, for ministry uh, foundationally, which is ongoing and uh, fruitful in an Indian slum context or among the poor in India. I think that in my experience I've seen two kinds of uh, deviation and perhaps by looking at them one can see perhaps or at least imagine the right way. One kind of deviation is when you pauperize people by making them totally dependent upon your charitable activities and you make them simply the recipients. Uh, I have seen that going on in uh, Madras slum, which is simply a case of handing out relief, which doesn't fundamentally change. I mean, it, it, it helps people to live, but it doesn't fundamentally change the situation. The other extreme is the kind of um, highly politicized revolutionary approach of people like Saul Alinsky. Um, where you conscientize the people and uh, in my experience and I have been involved with that you y y you have to develop a kind of hatred uh, you have to you have to de you have to identify the enemy and then learn to hate the enemy and to fight against it um, and that's the other extreme and I have seen that being done in um, certain kinds of community activity so somewhere in between those two, it seems to me there is a model uh, where, which is the incarnational model, where you do become part of the community and share its troubles and pains. And uh, where you become part of the community and share its troubles and pains, and where you help local leadership to develop, discerning where there is the potential of leadership and encouraging and strengthening and supporting it all the time. Um, that seems to me to be 
And you see, again, coming back to what I said earlier, the Holy Spirit, one has to be, one has to be a little humble in these matters. In, in, the Holy Spirit works in his own ways, and sometimes in quite unexpected ways. Um, people are led to take initiatives, and so which may not have been planned by you at all. And, and you have to be ready, as it were, to, to, to acknowledge that and recognize it and go along with it. I don't think I'm probably just waffling here. I, I don't think I really have a simple blueprint answer to your question, but there's where somewhere in that area, I think, the right way lies. I think I could say two things. One comes from the beginning of my life as a Christian, and the other, I don't know how near the end of it I am, but somewhere around about here. I, I, the Christian faith first became alive to me in a, in a very, very tough experience when I was involved uh, with unemployed miners in South Wales, um, committed to a program of social service to help them. It was a program which did not involve any kind of element of evangelism or gospel. The, the people who were running it were very much against that. They wanted it, to, they would have regarded that as improper. They wanted simply to, to help. And God bless them, they, <laughs> they, they, did, they, they did their best. These very, I mean, in those days, this was the late 1920s, um, when there was no poor relief and, and no um, unemployment benefit, and these miners were just rotting in unemployment year after year. And in that situation, in a particular situation of, of special um, humiliation, uh, I had a vision of the cross as the one, the one reality which, which both goes right down to the depths of, of hell and yet has its top in heaven and, 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 and which embraces the whole world. And that is the point of reference for me in all thinking and ministry, the, 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 the cross of Jesus. Of course, it is the cross of the risen Jesus, I know that, and you must never separate them. But it is that, that reality, the given reality of what God has done in the cross. That's a datum, it's a fact, it's a given reality. The other thing, which is much more the perspective of an old man, is that having, one has seen so many fashions of thought rise and fall, and one has seen the church so foolishly, one after another, climbing onto these passing bandwagons and trying to be with it, you know. Uh, uh, and and if, you're, if you're really up to date, then five or ten years later you're just out of date. Um, the fact that the gospel and the church are realities which outlive not only fashions of thought, but nations and empires and, and, and cultures, um, that we, we represent something that is far, far more enduring than any of the things that are the substance of, of media coverage and so on. I, I think that one of the advantages of getting old <laughs> is that you've seen a lot of this come and go, and you can uh, not take it too seriously.